in our endeavor to cultivate a church culture of prayerfulness, I want us to consider this brutally honest question this evening. When you pray, does it feel like you're just saying the same old things about the same old things? That's a brutally honest question, isn't it? And that's a brutally honest question coming from this booklet entitled, Praying the Bible. The title of the book gives the solution to that brutally asked question problem. When you feel like you're just saying the same old things, and the answer to that is pray the Bible. That is, for instance, read a psalm. Uh, that song that we sang uh, ten, just now is a psalm, and it's a great prayer. Um, read a psalm and then pray back to the Lord what you just read from his word. Uh, you'll get that here. If you've never done anything like that, then I challenge you uh, tonight to start doing it. Get the book if you'd like uh, more information about it to be encouraged further to pray the Bible. And so along the lines of that introduction, I want us to take a look at the prayer in the New Testament church, the prayer life of the early New Testament church as recorded for us in the Bible, beginning with Acts 1.14. On your outline, please turn there to Acts 1.14. Central to the life of the church, central to the life of the early church is this activity called prayer. Jesus had just ascended to heaven after he gave the disciples the last commission, that is to make disciples of all ethnicities of the world. The disciples, can you imagine them? The disciples, they were just staring at the clouds there. They were just dazzled at this sight. The Bible tells us that two angelic beings appeared to them and told them, go on home. What Jesus told you, do that. Don't worry, he will come back in the same manner that you saw him go up into the clouds, go up into the heaven. That's the same way he's going to come back down to you that is visible and real in the flesh kind of way. And so they returned to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and then they met in an upper room. And so these disciples that made up the, I'm going to call it the Jerusalem Baptist Church, <laughs> met there in this upper room. And do you know what activity they did? Look at verse 14, Acts 1, 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Um, uh, that last phrase there is a reference to Jesus' half-siblings uh, primarily, and it can also refer to uh, the disciples, the apostles as well. Now, so central to uh, the life of the early church is this activity of prayer. Now, there are a myriad of instances and evidence in Scripture of this statement in the book of Acts, but we're not going to go um, into them tonight. When the church met, invariably, one of their primary activities was to pray. And so, um, number two on your outline, look at Acts 13. Two. The New Testament prayed about the selection and ordination of Christian workers. Now, we know that an 
ordination ceremony is not necessarily an act by the church to confer or to uh, give orders, to confer holy orders on someone to, to, to make them a pastor or to make them a missionary. Um, that's not what an ordination ceremony does. What an ordination ceremony is, is a recognition of God's ordination in someone's life, okay? The church is not the entity to give orders that so-and-so should be a pastor or so-and-so should be a missionary or so-and-so should be a deacon. God is the one who does ordination, right? We understand that, right? God is the one who ordain people into the ministry. What the church responsibility is, is to what? To evaluate and then recognize those gifted individuals in the church that yes, I can see God's ordination in that somebody who wants to be a pastor. Yes, I can see God's gift in that somebody who wants to be a missionary. That's what ordination in the church means, okay? Uh, let's look at verses two and three, um, Acts 13. Beginning, let's, let's begin in verse one. <clears throat> now there were in the church that was at Antioch, okay, Antioch is north of Jerusalem. In fact, this is in the nation of Syria, not in Israel. Antioch, Syria, certain prophets, all right, there were prophets in the church. In the early church, there were prophets. That is in the sense of preaching judgment as in the Old Testament. And these prophets conveyed divine revelation or interpret the Old Testament with new insights and teachers. That's a reference to pastors, elders, bishops, and um, pastors, yeah. As, and there's some named here, Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, um, meaning he was a black man and or somebody from Niger, uh, from Africa, and Lucius of Cyrene. Some think this is Dr. Luke, but it's not Dr. Luke. And Manain, Manain, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, that is, this was Herod's, uh, King Herod's foster brother or somebody who grew up in his household. Um, but it's more than that, really, uh, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. And Saul, okay, Saul, this is Saul of Tarsus, the, um, the one who became the Apostle Paul later on. Verse number two, as they ministered to the Lord, that is when they were just worshiping God in, in prayer and supplications and fasted, the Holy Ghost um, prompted them, said to them, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And so when they um, recognized the prompting of the Holy Spirit, they continued to, verse number three, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so the early New Testament church prayed about the selection and ordination of Christian workers. Now, uh, let me let you in on uh, something here in our church. Uh, we are blessed to have two young men in our congregation who have expressed to me their desire to preach the gospel, uh, desire to preach the word of God. And so I tell you now, my church, as your pastor, I take that seriously 
And I take that as my responsibility to influence you, the congregation, to pray with me for them, right? And to eventually recognize these two men's ordination um, as they believe they are called to preach the gospel, called to preach the word of God. And I, am as your pastor, will influence you, the congregation, to help me pray for them with me and train them and equip them for the work uh, that God, as they believed, had ordained them uh, to do. All right? So Lord willing, a few years from now, four or five years, we will uh, have a ordination ceremony for uh, these men, Lord willing. All right? But my point tonight is to uh, review what the Word of God says about that, which is we just read in Acts 13, 1, 2, and 3, that is the whole church is involved in that. Not just the pastor, not just the leaders of the church, but the entire congregation is uh, supposed to be involved with that. Number three, on your outline, Acts 12, 5. Just across the page there from where you're at, Acts 12, 5, they prayed during persecution is your blank there. The New Testament church prayed during persecution. The apostle James, okay, not James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, but the apostle James, the brother of John, Zebedee, uh, the sons of thunder, as the Lord um, called them. The apostle James had just been killed by Herod the king. And the people of Israel seemed to like that. And so King Herod now also proceeded to take the apostle Peter as a prisoner. And guess what the church did? Well, you already guessed it. The church did pray. Look at verse number five. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They had a emergency prayer meeting, and they kept vigil. They did not cease to pray until the Lord sprung Peter out of prison. All right, so the practice of prayer was activated. Number four, look at Acts 9.40. The New Testament church prayed for healing. We have here the case of Tabitha, a church member in the church at Joppa, one of the coastal cities of Israel, in the inspired words of Dr. Luke, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Well, she became very sick, and days later, she actually succumbed to death. And it just so happened that the apostle Peter was in the area, was in Joppa, and so they called for the apostle Peter to pray for Tabitha's healing. Well, in this case, Tabitha's um, to be raised from the dead. Uh, this is even more remarkable because Tabitha had already died, as I had mentioned. The New Testament church, however, um, had this kind of hope uh, still. Naturally, we would, we would think it's too late, but this is remarkable. Uh, the faith with which the church members had, look at verse number 40 of Acts 9, 40. But Peter put them all forth. He asked them to, to, to leave the space there and kneeled down and prayed, turning him to the body 
said, Tabitha, arise, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she got up, she sat up, and obviously became alive. And so the early church uh, uh, prayed for healing, okay? Number five. Colossians 4, 2, the apostles taught on the importance of prayer in church life. Over and over in the epistles, whether it's the apostle Paul or Peter or John the Beloved or the other apostles' associates, they all taught on the importance of prayer. Paul says uh, we should be continuing instant in prayer. That's in Romans 12, 12. Peter says, but the end of all things is, is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And here in Colossians uh, chapter 4, verse 2, the apostle of Jesus Christ writes, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. The apostle taught on the importance of prayer in church life. Number six. Stay there in Colossians. And I want us to look at verses three and four of Colossians chapter four. The apostles taught the church to pray for the spread of the gospel. Pray for the spread of the gospel. Look at verses three and four. With all praying also for us. Who is the us there? Well, that's the Apostle Paul. That is Pastor Timothy. And uh, the, uh, Dr. Luke as well was with him. Epaphras. Uh, one of the elders in, Coloss in Colossae. So he's asking the Christians there, and by extension, us today, to pray for the church leaders. For what? Well, let's continue reading. That God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So the apostle of Jesus Christ there taught the early church, taught the Colossians to pray for opportunities to spread the gospel, opportunities to speak of the good news of Jesus Christ and uh, the spread of the gospel message. And so, by extension tonight, we need to be praying uh, that the Lord would open up doors for, not just for the pastor, not just for the church leaders, but for all members of our local body, opportunities to speak of the gospel for the spread of the gospel. This is a great, great prayer uh, to, to have. Number seven. On your outline, James 5, 14. The first pastor of Jerusalem, James, taught the church to pray for the sick. This is James, who was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in Jesus initially, but after the resurrection of his half-brother, he was converted and turned out to be an ordained pastor of the Jerusalem church. Okay, look at verse 14 of James chapter 5. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Elders, that's the pastors, bishops, teachers. Let him call for the elders of the church and do what? Let them pray over him, over the sick, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So Pastor James taught 
the church to pray for the sick. So the sick here is the one being encouraged to do what? To contact the pastors or elders of the church to pray over him or her and anoint oil on him or her in the name of the Lord. And so James taught the church to pray for the sick. And the emphasis here is prayer, not anointing with oil, which according to one commentator, literally means rubbing him with oil. Uh, there's a couple ways to look at this. Number one, possibly this is a reference to ceremonial anointing. Number two, on the other hand, James may have had in mind medical treatment of, of believers, listen, who were physically bruised and battered because of persecution. Because the early church, they were very much persecuted. They were assaulted physically and battered physically. And they would have a ready hand for them, some oils to put over to ameliorate the bruises on their bodies. This might have been a reference to that. But this commentator said, perhaps it is better to understand the anointing in a metaphorical sense of the elders' encouragement, comforting, and strengthening the believer just by being there, just by praying for them. All right? One church member um, messaged me a few years ago and said, Pastor, I believe the Bible literally. And the Bible says that the sick should call the elders of the church and anoint oil on the sick and pray for the sick. He said, my child is very sick and uh, I want you to come and anoint my child with oil and pray for my child. I said, sure, I'll come. And so I asked Brother Steve to go with me and we went to Loma Linda. We met the parents there and we prayed over the sick child and um, I asked him if the child was allergic to some sort of uh, oil and he said, no, uh, she's not allergic to any of that and so I used what I had with me and, and we anointed her with oil and prayed some more. The parent prayed uh, for the child. I prayed, Brother Steve prayed and the mother also prayed. And that following Sunday, um, that member of the church got up here and testified to the fact that the Lord healed that child. And uh, we praise the Lord for that. So Pastor James teaches that the church ought to pray for the sick, uh, encourage the sick to be the one to contact the pastors and elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil and so on. So this is a uh, practice that they did in the early church. Number eight, lastly tonight, stay here in James. The pastor taught the church to pray for sinners. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at verse number 16. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The idea here is very much related to what I taught to you last week on prayer and burden bearing. You remember that? The idea is uh, not that of a confessional booth that you and I are familiar with, uh, that which is practiced by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that's not the idea here, all right? We don't have a confessional booth here. We have an audiovisual booth, but we, that's not a confessional booth, all right? That's not the idea here, okay? That's not a biblical idea. 
where you, you have a priest as a representative of Jesus Christ on earth and you confess to that uh, person and wait for his absolution of your sins. That's not a biblical idea. What James is teaching here is, listen, mutual confession. Did you get that? Mutual confession. Since you and I have become priests. The moment we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, we became priests in the kingdom of God. If so be that we are Christ's and Christ is in us. One Bible scholar writes, to confess your sins here is mutually honest, openness and sharing of needs that will enable believers to uphold each other in the spiritual struggle, end quote. The Bible is replete with real and practical ideas what to pray for. Uh, so we come full circle to my introductory, brutally ask, honest question. When you pray, does it ever feel like you're just saying the same old things about the same old things? Well, when you read the scripture, you read about the prayers of the believers in scripture, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to pray back God's words to the Father when you pray. And so, I pray that you will start practicing this if you have not done so already. If you have done this before and you have uh, stopped doing it, I encourage you tonight uh, to pick this up, pick this practice back up and be encouraged by the myriad of examples in the scripture. We looked at just a few tonight, uh, but um, that's what we should be doing. That's why this lesson tonight is entitled Prayer in the Church. May this be a blessing to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the reminders that we find in your word about prayer in the church. Help us as a local body uh, to practice, practice these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, let's uh, partner up tonight, men with men, ladies with ladies. Couples can stay together if you choose to do that. That's fine. And uh, for those of you watching us online, uh, the prayer requests that uh, we mentioned tonight will be on your monitor. So I hope that you'll linger around and pray with us this evening. You may be dismissed after prayer.